everyone, and welcome to the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world show made for the fans by a fan. I am your host as always, Richard Tiemann, and this is the award-winning fan show. like to thank you all for joining me on this Tuesday. We're going to try this thing again. Give it uh, a mulligan on this one. I don't know what was going on before. It was saying that I needed to free up some space on my computer, which is funny because 90% of what is occupying the space on my computer isn't even fan show stuff. It's stuff for school, the Dan Patrick School of Sportscasting, as you see in my lovely modified background behind me. But anyway, I uh, emptied my recycle bin for the first time uh, ever because I have a problem with uh, trying to let go of things. I hoard uh, not physical stuff, but stuff on my computer and my technology. Uh, If you went on my phone and looked through all the photos, it'd be photos from years and years and years. And just uh, I I have a a hard time uh, letting go of things, even if they're on multiple places like on instagram and facebook and whatever so here we are we're trying it again uh episode 450 and this is where everyone's a fan of something and we have got something for every fan especially if you're a fan of week two we've got some great overreactions to week two right now uh my guest this evening that's right we're back with guests now uh he is a full sale alumni i met him during hall of fame week while i was down in orlando on campus he's a great guy he's a sports marketing whiz and he's also a Boston fan. So uh, there was a lot of talk of the New England Patriots, who are no stranger to Week 2 uh, reactions, as we've seen in the past. But we've got some of the uh, best ones for you, including uh, the best or the worst best 2-0 team. The most fake 2-0 team right now is our topic of discussion so without further ado or any more delay let's go ahead and get to today's headlines And headlines, of course, brought to you by Dynamite Enterprises. They can customize your world. You should really check them out. They can do amazing stickers like this. Some of you have some of these. Some of you have all of them, and some of you have yet to even have a single one, so you need to get on that. They can do hats. They can do T-shirts. They can do tablecloths, business cards, you name it. They can probably try it. And uh, as I said on the first go at this episode, they could probably even do custom balls at this point. Sports balls. Get your mind out of the gut fan nation but yes they could probably do those kinds of balls uh football baseball basketball whatever i have never seen them do it but i'm sure they're up for the task they can also do trophies uh they've really been getting into uh more fantasy football trophies since it is fantasy football season obviously and other fantasy sports trophies and then just awards and trophies in general they've really up their game on that uh they do belts but uh, of course our premier belt provider is undisputed belts who is sponsoring our fourth annual Fan Nation Fantasy Football League, which I am now one and one thanks to a loss of uh, Jimmy Allen, your mom's favorite kicker, as he's called on uh, Twitter. But uh, yeah, go ahead and visit dynamiteenterprises.com. And if you know what you want or you have a question, then email Ethan at dynamiteenterprises.com. And I think for today, we'll do something uh, very special. We're going to go through headlines uh, with some, um, let's see here. Oh, none of it saved. Sad day. Oh, boo. Let's see here. <laughs> oh, I thought I had it saved, but I guess I don't. I had all these these hotkeys here that are saved. And let's see if I can get it. There we go. Perfect. All right. We've got them. So <laughs> we're going to go through headlines watching the uh, 49ers Bengals highlights because it is a great day to be a 49ers fan. 49ers beat the Bengals 41 to 17 after the Seahawks beat them at home by one point, which will be something to make note of as we get back to our core topic of discussion. Uh, Thank you, Adam, Matt, Devin, and Nigel for joining me. 
Uh, Adam says the Eli era is over. That is correct. First headline up is that the Giants have announced that they will be starting Mr. Daniel Jones at quarterback for week three. And so does that mean the end of an era, at least in New York? Does Eli have any time left as a starter? Or is this going to be one of those cases where he's uh, forever a backup now, uh, like Matt Hasselbeck was for a long time with the Colts? And he was the probably the best backup in the league. He had his chance to shine um, on a few occasions because of Luck's injuries. But I don't see that being the same story uh for Eli really I don't I think that Eli will probably hang him up after this season I mean you would you want to be a backup somewhere else I just I will ask that question would you want if you're Eli Manning would you want to be a backup somewhere and if you do where could you see Eli being a backup at of course this is I, I don't think it would happen this season Um, There are a few teams out there in need of a starting quarterback, including the New Orleans Saints and maybe possibly the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, All three teams are making quarterback changes, but only one of them voluntarily. So the Giants, they're going to go with their uh, first round pick, Daniel Jones. He will take over for Eli, but Ben Roethlisberger, season done. Uh, He had some uh, elbow issues and so he will have surgery and uh enter mason rudolph who i guess was serviceable in that second half he brought them back in the game and then still eventually lost to the seahawks but i guess he did quite well according to those that watched which i did not uh good to see luke chiming in here as well as brandon good to see you guys we're talking about uh the three quarterback changes in the nfl right now new orleans pittsburgh and New York, and how only one was a voluntary quarterback change. Uh, New Orleans, Drew Brees is out for six weeks. Uh, It could be sooner, could be a little longer. I think the actual um, uh, prediction was six to eight weeks, but of course everybody's going to be hoping it's sooner rather than later. And uh, six weeks would put them in him back against the Falcons the week before that though I think is their game against the Cardinals which if I'm the Saints I'd want to have him back that week before to really get him some reps assuming that the Cardinals don't really do anything with their season um I I don't know they've been really terrible uh, the first two weeks and I don't believe that's an overreaction But yes, Drew Brees has a thumb issue, and so he is out. He will have surgery on that, and it will put him out uh, six weeks. Joe Staley, uh, 49ers uh, offensive lineman, he is out for about six to eight weeks with a fractured fibula, and that sucks because I do love Joe. I think Joe's a great guy, but uh, man, 41-17 against the Bengals look at those highlights look at that oh look at I just I love watching highlights of the Niners this is so great (laughs) so just gonna let those play uh the Dallas Cowboys have improved to 2-0 and uh some people are thinking that they're the most fake 2-0 team which is funny they beat the Giants yes they beat the Redskins yes with which both teams are 0-2, but those are both division rival teams. So I'm surprised people are so quick to think that the Cowboys are the most fake 2-0 team. But I have my thoughts on the matter, and Joe Zolo, he shares his thoughts. I wasn't too pleased with him. Um, Hint, hint, spoiler, spoiler. And for that interview, you guys will need to kick it over to Spreaker.com to hear that in its entirety. I don't know how to do audio yet on the OBS for you guys watching um, on the Facebook Live, but I do appreciate you tuning in on Facebook Live. It's been a lot of fun. So Nigel says, yes, my Steelers will welcome Eli with open arms. You know, that wouldn't be the oddest pairing. It really wouldn't. Um, But I do think, though, that the Saints could make a move for Eli uh, if the the Giants are open to it. I mean, let's be honest here. The Giants are open to just about anything. They traded Odell Beckham Jr. to the Browns, who got a win last night. It was against the Jets, which, uh, I mean, the Browns against the Jets and on Monday Night Football, that specific matchup, that's been money. 
because they did that last year too. And that was the end of the streak because they tied in week one against the Steelers. So they still couldn't find their way into the win column. They got closer, but they couldn't do it. <laughs> and so there's, there's a win out there just like, Hey guys, who wants me? And the Steelers and Browns are like, nah, we're good fam. <laughs> but then they went and they got it, um, over the Jets on Monday Night Football, I believe, was the matchup. Or was it Thursday Night Football? It was one of the primetime games, but that seems to be the money matchup for the Browns as far as uh, uh, proving the hype. I don't know. I'm still not sold on the Browns. Uh, Joe Zolo also comments on the Browns and how he had them picked to go to the postseason to win that division, and he doesn't believe that that will be the case. So as far as a quick recap for week two, let's go ahead and take it from the top here. We have the 49ers. I don't know if you heard. They defeated the Cincinnati Bengals 41-17. to You can see the, uh, the highlights right there that I'm playing for. You should really enjoy those because they're a lot of fun. Buccaneers upset, in my opinion, upset. Some people may not have think may not have thought this think may not have thought this was an upset but it was a short week for both teams i had the panthers at home not by a lot but by a little but it was the bucks that got the win 20 to 14 so carolina starts out 0 and 2 did not see that one coming cowboys 31 21 over the redskins in washington colts narrowly escaping the titans i feel so bad for those of you that i said that this was one of my three survivor picks but there's something about that that colts titans game that you can just never really count uh, either of them out it's the strangest thing i i love a good division rivalry i really do but the titans can look red hot and the colts will come in and be like no not today and so 1917 is your final from tennessee seahawks 28 26 over the Steelers, they have outscored their opponents by three points in two games as far as the final score is considered. Three points. And people dare say that the 49ers are the most fake 2-0 and team. Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm. Adam comments the Eagles were a walking mash unit in the second half of that game. Uh, Luke says he knows. <laughs> what a crap show. Uh no, it's okay, Luke. I'll censor it if I need to. I'll bleep it. Nigel says, what do you think about Broncos versus the Bears? I didn't watch that game. Um, I think I had the Broncos, though, and the Bears got away with the win. The Bills beat the Giants 28-14, so it wasn't a one-point win, but they are 2-0 and now. I want you to keep that in mind. The Bills of Buffalo are 2-0. and Think about that. Okay, Patriots thump the Dolphins and then some, 43 to nothing. Uh, some people thought that this might have been that typical scenario where the uh, Patriots lose to the Dolphins somehow, but not uh, not this time around, which I wonder if that means that the Patriots will not make it to the Super Bowl or win it because usually they need that Dolphins loss to really fire them up, and it happens within like the first four weeks of the season. Once everybody has come out saying that the dynasty and that the era of Belichick Brady is over. So I wonder if this in turn means that it could also be over. That's a week two overreaction, by the way. Jaguars, they lose to the Texans 13 to 12. Good for the Texans. Jaguars, I, I don't know what's going on there. Vikings and Packers. Um, Packers are 2-0, and and I don't think that they should have won either of those games, really. I, I mean, that was the luckiest interception in the history of, of recent interceptions that you can have uh, late in that game against the Vikings. Uh, Chargers lose to the Lions. I don't know how. So the Lions are now 1-0-1. Oh, and, and then we had the uh, Cardinals losing to the Ravens, 23-17. Uh, Ravens are 2-0, and oh, but they have beaten the Dolphins and the Cardinals. Take it for what it's worth. And then the Rams over the Saints. Of course, this was a uh, breezeless Saints team, really, for a majority of the game. 27-9 is your final. Bears and Broncos. The Bears get two over the Broncos. 16-14 is your final. Falcons, Eagles, Falcons, uh, in my opinion, upset the Eagles, uh, twenty-four to twenty, and that is going to be your final score from Atlanta. And then finally, Monday night, as I mentioned, the Browns over the Jets, twenty-three to twenty. So here we have Week Two, and of course, it is uh, a great time in the NFL to be Week Two, and you have uh, several 
two and O teams, and some that are surprising, some not so surprising. Bills two and O, surprising. Patriots two and O, not so surprising. The rest of the division is O and two, so a very split division in the AFC East. In the North, only one team remains unbeaten. That's the Ravens at two and O. The Bengals and Steelers are 0-2, and the Browns are 1-1. We have not, this is not the strangest thing we've seen from the AFC North. I think it started out the same way last year, too. Uh, There are no undefeated teams remaining in the South. They're all 1-1, except for the Jags at 0-2. In the West, the Chiefs are 2-0, and it was, oh my god, it was hilarious listening to this radio broadcast, because it was like their featured game on ESPN Radio as we're driving back from Colville. And they're, the the Raiders are up like 10 nothing, and the guy, I, I cannot believe he did it, but he's just like, you know, everybody had the Chiefs picked in the AFC Championship against the Patriots, and right now I'm not thinking that that's such a good pick. It's like, dude, it's the first quarter. <laughs> that was so good. Oh, people are dumb, and yet they have full-time jobs on radio, and I don't. Whatever. Um, let's see. Nigel says, how do you feel about Ramsey wanting to be traded? I don't blame him. I think the entire Miami Dolphins team wanting to be traded. I don't blame them either. Uh, but Jalen Ramsey is going to be quite the acquisition wherever he goes, but it's going to be a team that is really missing like one key component in their secondary. I would like to see him on the 49ers because we lost one of the members of our secondary. So I think Ramsey would be fantastic addition. And we're a team that's kind of on the bubble and defensively, we need a little bit of help. Everybody's just like, Oh, he's going to go to the Patriots. Cool, man. Like everybody goes to the freaking Patriots, whatever. Um, let's see what was, uh, Luke's ask, what was your prediction outcome for last week for which game? Cause I had the, my three survivor picks, which the Ravens were one over the Cardinals. And if you picked that one, congratulations. I had the chargers over the lions though. That one did not come true. So hopefully you guys avoided my advice in that one. And then I had the, uh, the Titans over the Colts. Hopefully you guys did not pick that one, but the Ravens over the Cardinals. I thought that was like an easy one, like a gimme because a lot of people were going chiefs over Raiders is the easy one. But, um, and of course, Patriots over Miami. So there is one undefeated team left in the AFC West. That's the chiefs on the NFC side. There is only one undefeated team in the East. That's the Cowboys two and O and then the Redskins and giants are Oh, and two in the North. Only one undefeated team. That's the Packers at 2-0. and And then, of course, in the South, no undefeated teams. In fact, three of them sit at 1-1, one one, except for the Panthers, who are 0-2. Not sure I saw that one coming. And then in the NFC West, that's right, 49ers division, there are not one, not two, but three undefeated teams remaining at 2-0. and The 49ers, the Seahawks, and the Rams. And if you look right there right now, the 49ers sit atop the division, I don't care if it's just for this week. I'm going to enjoy every last second of it because that's what I do. Good to see you, Derek. We're talking 49ers. Uh, overall, uh, Luke is asking overall how I did. I, I think I went 7-9. and nine. It was a terrible, terrible week. It really was. Um, I picked the Saints over the Rams as like a revenge game. Uh, I mean, that had all the makings for it. It really did. And then I had Pittsburgh at home against the Seahawks just because of how lousy they played against Cincinnati at home. And there was a few others that were just poor choices by me. Uh, I had the Vikings over the Packers, which really looked like a great pick there uh, for about three out of four quarters. That looked like it was going to be a good pick. And then I think I had the Redskins over the Cowboys just because the Cowboys only had a win over the Giants and the Redskins beat the Eagles, which I think is a way better quality opponent than the the Giants are. But um, I think also, obviously, I had the the, uh, Titans over the Colts because that was one of the three survivor pool options I had. That didn't happen. And then the Chargers over the Lions, and that didn't happen. So it was it was a really weird week in the NFL. But nonetheless, here we are, week two, and uh, yeah, seven and nine. So I went from eleven and four to seven and nine. I'm going to look to rebound in week three, which we will talk about my three picks for your survivor pool uh, on Thursday. I have a perfect guest lined up because the 49ers, after two East Coast road trips, victories, mind you, two and zero, oh, will. 
come back home for their home opener against the Pittsburgh Steelers. My guest is a Steelers fan, and I'm so excited to welcome him back to the show. It's been a long time, but he is uh, an internet celebrity of sorts. So here we are, your question of the day. We can end the 49ers highlights. I know you guys have seen enough of the glory that has been them. So the uh, let's go ahead and switch back here. So here is is what I have for you as far as our question of the day. The most fake 2-0 team is. My three picks, as far as if I was going to do a a Facebook poll, were the Packers, the Bills, and the Seahawks. And I think each one (coughs) has their own reason as to why they could be the most fake 2-0 team. And a lot of people are thinking, fake 2-0, like they're 2-0. Yeah, I get it. But, um, (laughs) and yes, Luke, I did pick the Eagles over the Falcons, actually, because I thought that uh, they played very good against uh, Washington, you know, in that comeback win. So the most fake 2-0 team is, this is where you guys are welcome to chime in. Uh, It's obviously not going to be the Patriots. The Bills are 2-0. They narrowly escaped the Jets, and then they beat the Giants. Um, And that was a comeback win, actually. So the Giants, yes, 0-2. The Jets also 0-2. Strength of schedule, strength of opponent, not very much on their side. But it's the Bills, though. That's the most surprising thing. So could you really say that they're fake when they're doing very un- Buffalo Bills like things right now with a 2 and 0 record. I mean, both of those games are games they should have lost. Like they should have done everything in their Buffalo powers to lose each one of those games. I mean, to beat the Jets by 1 point on the road. That's a game that normally the Bills will lose. And then to beat the Giants in a comeback effort. That is a game the Bills normally will lose. So I do not believe, I repeat, I do not believe the Bills are the most fake 2-0 team. So that leaves the Packers and the Seahawks. The Packers narrowly escaped the Bears. They scored the game's lone touchdown, and it was just sloppy, messy football. I really don't know how they came out of the midway with a win, but... They came out of the midway with a win. That's a tough game. Divisional opponent on the road to start off your week, to start off your season, the entire season. That was the season kickoff. And then they scored a bunch of points in the first quarter against Minnesota and were able to sit on and hold that lead. Regardless of how lucky the interception was, it was still a key play that they needed to lock up the win. They got the first down that they needed on the ensuing drive and left Minnesota with all of what? Uh, eight seconds left on the clock to try to, to win it down four points. I mean, Minnesota had every chance to win that game there late and they, they didn't do it. So I, I don't know if that's more on the Packers side or more on the Minnesota side, but nonetheless, Green Bay came out with a win And it was a quality win against a divisional opponent, and they may not have had to mount a comeback, but they were able to hold on to the lead that they had for three out of the four quarters. So that leaves us with the Seahawks, because I do not believe that the Packers are the most fake 2-0 team. The Seahawks, I believe, are the fakest 2-0 team I've ever seen in my life. And that's not just the 49ers fan in me. I mean, they have outscored their opponents in two weeks by three points. Bengals at home at CenturyLink Field, the place that they're not ever supposed to lose. They got out with a one-point win against the Bungles of Cincinnati. Then they go on the road to the Steelers, and they beat them by two points, and it almost was, I mean, it was almost... A game that they lost to a backup quarterback. And yes, Connor was also out. So the the Seahawks right now, I am not convinced. I do not believe they deserve to be 2-0. But at the same time, this is Seahawks football. They do just enough to get the win. But man, these wins are scary. <laughs> if you're a Seahawks fan, man, I that's that's a tough pill to swallow beating two AFC North opponents, which that's a division which right now has the Ravens at 2-0 against 
two zero and two teams, and then the Browns at one and one. Those are not quality wins by any means. Let's see what you guys have to say here. Uh, Luke says, uh, "Easy, San Francisco, uh, dude. I will, I will block you and ban you from the page. I will delete your comments so fast, Luke. How dare you?" Matt says the Packers survived against two quality teams. As I said, divisional opponents, one away, one at home. They did everything that they needed to do to get the win. Uh, Luke says, I'll one up you and say that the most fake 0 and 2 team is the Dolphins. They're gaming the system for a first round and they have six second round picks. And I don't know how many second round picks they have, but if that's the long if that is a long con, they need to have a better head coach than they do right now. I mean, you can get away with that stuff when you hire John Gruden, you know, the $100 million man in uh, Oakland slash Vegas for the Raiders. You can get away with uh, planning for the future and building for tomorrow. But uh, Miami, I don't think, has that kind of leeway. I really don't. Um, Adam Gase had that kind of leeway, and he did not do very much with it. So if you're Miami, you're on borrowed time if you're a head coach. And if these are going to be the the kind of games that we're going to get used to seeing out of Miami, then, um, God, man, it might be – they might be the next San Francisco, which is good news because I think San Francisco's in good hands with Lynch and Shanahan right now. It looks like they are putting the right pieces in place. But they had to go through Jim Tom Sula. They had to go through Chip Kelly in order to get to Kyle Shanahan and uh, John Lynch and turn that whole thing around. So Miami, they might be the new – Cleveland Browns. Oh, God, that was weird to say. Wow, did I really say that? I did. Um, also, we are in the tournament championship for BattleBots. Uh, the tournament, we have all 16. Thursday, they will unveil the 16 seeds as far as who is where and who is fighting who. And then that first round, first part of the first round will begin uh, Friday on an all new episode and my content from BattleBots were finally at the fights I was there to see. So uh, I have more and more interviews coming out, which has been a lot of fun to release and share with you guys. And we had a great weekend. Uh, we had a little bit of a getaway. It was a late anniversary present from my wife to me as we went up to Colville, uh, which is the Lake Roosevelt area, Kettle Falls, beautiful area. And uh, it did rain. It was a, a like a mist kind of the whole time. But we we slayed the crap out of the walleye and they were delicious brian clum and his girlfriend tawny were a lot of fun uh to be with it was our first camping trip as a couple actually we had uh, in five years being married seven years being together we've never gone camping before we have camped like we have stayed you know on the floor of a living room with friends and family that we're visiting or whatever but we've never actually like set to go camping and done the tent sleeping bag air mattress and fire pit and all that and it was a, a hell of a lot of fun it really was so thank you again to brian clum and clum dog outdoors for uh letting us tag along to catch like 40 walleye it was so much fun it really was there's plenty of pictures and videos you guys have probably seen and let's see the uh next ifl owners meeting is happening this weekend unfortunately that is not enough notice for me to make it down there and you're just like well why would you be at the owners meeting well i have finished my proposal and i'm sending it off to the commissioner and the owners who i have their contact information for and basically i'm going to tell them that it is in your best interest to let the fan show and myself be the media partners of the ifl because it will create a new revenue stream for the teams and the league and could open the door to national and league sponsors. So if you guys are fans of the IFL, once I send this proposal off, you need to be in the ear and tap in the shoulder of your team, their front office, their ownership, because I, I crunched the numbers. I looked over everything last night. This is a touchdown. It really is, in my opinion. I've gone over it with my wife, who is she's a, a bookkeeper. She crunches numbers. A few friends and uh, you know uh, coworkers that I know of that are very good about this thing. They're going to shoot me straight, and they believe that it is a uh, a great thing to do because it would officially separate the IFL from every other league out there. They would be the only one to have something like this. That would be the fan show and everything that comes with it. Me, obviously. Uh, and then the tour and the top 10 plays and the coverage that you get. So this is a slam dunk touchdown 
home run idea for the IFL that I hope that they go for. So uh, that's also happening. Uh, Adam says Baron Corbin is the 2019 King of the Ring. So this year's King of the Ring theme was why even bother? <laughs> yeah. Oh, Matt says someone is sleeping on the couch tonight. Uh, I, what do you what do you mean by that, Matt? I'm not sleeping on the couch except for the fact that I think that the Seahawks are the most fake two and O team. I'm sure she can understand her team's two and like she really cares. And Luke says, sorry, I'm chiming in a lot, uh, but two quick questions. Where do you think Drake is going, and wherever he goes, do you think he'll shine? That's a tough call, man. I don't. Uh, Drake, I think it's kind of like a Carlos Hyde, Frank Gore, and what? what's another running back that they were with a team for a while and never got a whole lot of, of – play and then they went to another one and they were a backup but then they got their moments and it worked out really well so i think he's gonna be that that guy where it's gonna it he's gonna land with a team that doesn't look like it's gonna fit but then he's gonna get his chance and then he will shine so i think that's that's what we're looking at for drake um yes fozzy is sleeping on the couch right now isn't he no he's not he's somewhere else he's on his his cat tree uh as far as cat news um look i can't have kids and that's not news to a whole lot of people but uh, our pets are our kids and we treat them as such and uh, our oldest baby kitty who is the first cat to ever warm up to me i'd been a dog person all my life uh, she has hyperthyroidism and they've given her you know x amount of years to live with this treatment with that treatment and with no treatment and it has broken my wife's heart. This is a cat she's had for 13 years, and it's been a part of my life for 17 years. Uh, the cat is that uh, best friend that you need approval from before you can, you know, ask for um, the friend's hand in marriage. Is is how I put it. And it took a long time for me to get baby kitty's approval, but uh, you know, it's tough right now. I don't know if we're gonna do a GoFundMe. I hate GoFundMe's. I've done a couple for myself and maybe if this one is done for someone else, it being our, our cat, one of our fur kids that it'll have a better turnout, but we might do a GoFundMe. Um, I'll probably try to sell some shirts, but we're going to try to raise some money to get her the treatment. That's going to give her the best quality and longest, uh, remaining time left here with us. So, um, if my wife seems a little distant, if she seems a little um, not herself, it's because of the news that we got yesterday. I mean, this year has been – it started off so great. I knew it was going to be a tale of two years. The first half of the year was fantastic. Then we had the news that I couldn't, obviously, with, with the kids thing. And then now our the the, one, the things that we consider kids, our, our cats and our dog – uh, now we're having to deal with medical issues there. So it's been a tough second half of the year, but I thank you guys so much for your continued support and everything that we do here on the fan show. And then, of course, I welcome a lot of you into our personal lives so a lot of you know what's going on. And uh, we'll see what happens there. Uh, T-shirts, hats, I don't know, GoFundMe. We'll see. I'll put up a post, and, and depending on the likes and whatever it gets, so that might make my decision for me. But uh, we have an interview coming up. Let's see these last couple of comments here. Uh, Matt says, uh, I share the bed with the cat, so no problem. <laughs> and then Luke says, CJ Anderson. Uh, yes, that would be another running back. That uh, That's a very good point. Marshawn Lynch, you could almost consider the same thing because he was originally with Buffalo, and then he got his chance to shine with Seattle. So I think Drake will be just fine. Um, but I, I don't think he's going to be one of those stellar, spectacular running backs. Like, I don't think he's going to be a guy that you take the first round of your fantasy season. But who knows? Um, I certainly wish him the best. I think he's a, a great talent and needs to find the right fit. And uh, Luke says, sorry, I appreciate that, man. I really do. So that is going to do it for this edition of The Fan Show, episode 450. And we are back with a special guest. And I will go ahead and invite you all over to go ahead and switch it to Spreaker.com. It's a great conversation. You won't want to miss it. You guys can keep commenting, though. On this, obviously, on the Facebook Live, and then, of course, there is a comments section on Spreaker.com. So without further ado or any more delay, here is my one-on-one with Joe Zolo. 
All right, ladies and gentlemen, joining me now, a very special guest. He is a Full Sail alumni. I actually had the uh, privilege and pleasure of meeting him at Hall of Fame week on the same panel as uh, guys like Steve Potter and uh, Angie Granger, who have also been on the show. He is the marketing director uh, for... um, Oh, I completely spaced it. I'm sorry, Joe. It is Joe Zolo. It is uh, Forefront. Forefront, right? You nailed it, yep. There we go. I got it. A little bit blank, but yes. Uh, marketing director. Uh, wow, what a title. And I assume that Full Sail helped you achieve such a title. Does that sound about right? Uh, it definitely does. Learn everything I can uh, attest to. I pretty much learned from all the awesome professors at Full Sail in the sports marketing program. You know, I had the uh, privilege and pleasure of meeting some of them as well, and they all seem like they have a really good pulse for the business. What would you say in your time during the sports marketing uh, program and then where you are now, what's been like the biggest change and maybe surprise for you as far as what you've had to learn between school and, and where you are? So the role I'm currently in is uh, I'm with a agency, so we specialize in analytics, digital innovation, and partnerships. So it's more business-to-business selling than it is business-to-customer or consumer, or in sports case, the fan. So instead of the team promoting something for a fan, I am the person promoting something for teams and organizations to actually want to work with us. So that's been kind of a different mindset shift personally um a lot of what they teach you in school and rightfully so is business to customer there's not too much focus on b2b um and that's kind of been a little shift i've had to do but it's been a lot of fun so far i've been about two months at this current job um graduated 14 months ago so it the career starting off pretty well uh personally it's not the end goal right now but i i can't wait to see where this takes me yeah, Forefront actually gave me a call because I submitted my resume and they wanted to interview me. They're like, "Yeah, so you gonna uh, can you come in tomorrow for an interview?" I was like, "Where's the interview at?" And they're like, "Pittsburgh." I'm like, "I'm I'm in Washington." So I mean, <laughs> if you you want to push this out a bit, they were looking for somebody local. Which hey, I get it. I'm just trying to get my foot, you know, really in any doors. So it's uh, that's been the grind, which I'm sure you uh, are all too familiar with. Yeah, starting with uh, right out of college, starting with the Boston Red Sox part-time, working with the recently debunked Manchester Monarchs. I interned with the Orlando Solar Bears. It's You take any job you can get, any foot in the door in sports, and then from there you just network and work your way into a full-time position and let the, let the ball roll from there. So is this – where you saw yourself once you went in for the degree and then graduated with it, and is this kind of your your dream job? And if so, what is a day in the life of Joe Zolo like? Uh, definitely not the end goal. Definitely not where I saw seen myself uh, going in. They ask you uh, obviously when you leave here, what's the dream job? What would you like to do? And of course, me being from Boston, I said I'd like to work for a Boston sports team. Um, before I die, essentially, is how I kind of worded it. And, again, fortunate enough, thankful enough for Chris and Sam, who worked at the Red Sox, to uh, offer me a part-time job with them for a year before I ended up moving down to Dallas and working in the current position I am now. Um, the, the end goal is to end up working with a professional sports team. I've always wanted to do that. That was a goal coming in, whether it be in Boston or somewhere else. Super excited for the esports industry, so breaking into that would be awesome. But I know I you can't get the dream job right out of college, which for everyone listening, sorry, it just doesn't happen. <laughs> uh, very rarely does it ever happen. So work your way. Make sure you work all these jobs. Volunteer wherever you can. Network your way, and, and eventually you're going to get to that dream job you've always wanted. Yeah, you know, and uh, there's a lot of truth to that. And I think one of the things that makes Full Sail so special that people ask me, they're just like, you know, how do you like it? And I say, I love it. Uh, I, I could not be happier in a degree program than I am in. Now, granted, of course, I'm one of the lucky few like you who I'm sure you saw this degree, and it's like it's a very specific degree. 
And you're like, yeah, I'm all about that. So for me to be there for the Dan Patrick School of Sports Casting as one of its inaugural classes, I mean, I'm very privileged and, and honored to be a part of that. But the thing is that makes Full Sail so special that I've noticed, uh, especially since my visit there during Hall of Fame week, is that, you know, it, you're going to laugh when I say this, but it's the absolute truth. So you all remember um, the uh, pyramid scheme phase where we have all suited up and gone to those interviews and then we sat in and about, you know, three minutes. And we're like, I know, I know exactly what this is. And um, but then you had friends that bought into it. Right. And they actually did fairly well for themselves. And the reason that I compare Full Sail to that isn't like the pyramid scheme thing. It's though if you believe in what they are teaching you, like if you're buying what they're selling and if you give back what they give you, there, there's nothing that you can't do. It's like the sky is the limit, but you have to buy into it in order to get out of it what you put in. Yeah, you, you have to, it, 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 kind of the word of it any better. You need, to, you need to put in the exact amount of time and the same amount of time, probably more than what you're doing in the classroom as well as outside of the classroom. Like when, when, I, w- when I wasn't in school as much as I was playing video games, I was doing internships, volunteering, um, working at the school, networking with current students, and those some of those current students I know now are off in some awesome jobs, and I still keep in touch with them. But the biggest thing is you you want to network, and it's it's less of an alumni group, and it's more like a family, especially in the sports programs. We're so small; um, everyone knows each other, and we're all here to just help each other. And that that that's one of the best things. That's the biggest thing I love about Full Sail is that even when you leave, every time you come back, it's you're always welcome with open arms just like at Hall of Fame week. That's my favorite week of the year. Oh, yeah, it was a fantastic week, and uh, your guys' panel was really something great. And I, I love that you grilled me with questions when I asked what it was like in some of the interview processes that you've had for some of the jobs. But you're, you're right. You know, it's the ability to think on your feet, overcome, and adapt on the fly. And that's a lot of what we are actually going to talk about today because um, you're a sports fan yourself, uh, Boston area. And, of course, I'm going to guess, venture a guess here that you're probably a New England Patriots fan. Yeah, uh, what is it, 73-3 to three so far in the first few weeks with their offense compared to their defense? Yeah, not not too shabby. Before we get into the meat of today's topic, which there's two questions that I wanted to ask you, but uh, as a Patriots fan, and I'm sure probably a lifelong one, I've always noticed that there's this moment in every offseason or even the beginning, the the very, very beginning of a new season where they get some sort of new weapon, some shiny toy for Brady. But it, it doesn't matter. It like they still are the Bill Belichick New England Patriots. And it doesn't matter what name you have on the offense next to Brady's. They are still going to go out there and play Patriot football because really the only time I remember a standout superstar if you want to call him that, was Randy Moss. Otherwise, it's been Edelman and Gronk. There was even Welker for a while there. But they have went and got Josh Gordon. Now they have Antonio Brown. And there was even that receiver from the Saints, and I still can't remember who it was, but this was a season or two ago that they got him, and everybody's like, it's it's done deal. Might as well just pencil him in as Super Bowl champs. But it's never been about that combination or that weapon. Have you noticed that yourself as a fan? Uh, yeah, I mean, the biggest, I mean, since the Brady Belichick era, really the biggest offseason acquisition that has really worked has been Randy Moss. Um, that That's really the only one. Everyone else has either been like small trades. Wes Welker wasn't anything before he came here. We drafted Julian Edelman. We drafted Rob Gronkowski. Um, the get of Josh Gordon was great. Obviously, we hope he stays well off the field. Uh, and then the get with Antonio Brown. I'm, I won't comment on what's happening off the field. Nothing has been done so far, but you cannot argue with his talent on the field. He's one of the best, if not the best receivers in the NFL. Um, and it's I, I'm less focused on that, more focused on the 42-year-old quarterback that's sitting back there <laughs> and how well, like last year you saw a drop in terms of his accuracy and the ball coming out. These first two weeks, he had a couple bad throws against Miami last week, but these first two weeks he's looked he's looked pristine, and I don't know if that's because of Jared Stidham behind him kind of being that motivating factor, same thing that when Jimmy Garoppolo was here, but 
I, I'm a fan of what Brady has looked like so far, and, and I'm always negative going into the season, especially with him and his deep ball, but he has looked really good throwing the football in all three phases of the game. Yeah, and let's go ahead then and open it up to our topic of the day, which is our question of the day, and that is the most fake 2-0 and team out there. Now, I have three candidates, and um, I realize that my own team, the 49ers, are a 2-0 and team, but in all honesty, like if you're going to have a bottom three, I don't feel that they deserve to be in it because you have, in my bottom three, you have the Green Bay Packers, the Buffalo Bills, and the Seattle Seahawks, and each one for its own reason. Now, Green Bay, I feel, has won games that it really shouldn't have. I mean, you're you're watching this matchup against Minnesota and they're driving and then the luckiest interception that you've ever seen in your life happens and then Green Bay is able to sit on the ball and give them back the ball with little to no time left at all and then in Chicago I mean that was just sloppy football everywhere and they just managed to score the game's only touchdown and that was enough for it Seattle really a similar thing though they've been able to put up a lot more points but they escape Cincy by one at home, at home, CenturyLink. If you've ever been to Washington, you know that this is like hollowed ground here and that this kind of thing just does not happen, but it almost did. And then they go on the road and they play a Pittsburgh team and let their backup QB get them back into the game and then narrowly escape there. The Bills, I, I don't even know. I picked them, uh, I picked the Jets against them in my survivor pool week one, and that bit me hard. And then somehow they managed to get another win. So you have three 2-0 and teams that I feel really shouldn't be, but I'll, I'll go ahead and hand it off to you. Who do you think is the most fake, undeserving 2-0 and team right now? So I, I was thinking the Bills, and as I went through it, I've seen Josh Allen progress extremely well from year one to year two in terms of he's able to throw the ball short, middle, deep, and the fact that he seems to be reading the field a little bit better. He did have some ball security issues in week one, and they did just narrowly escape with a win. That just kind of shows how bad New York is and less of how good Buffalo is. And again, they played the Giants last week. They're not a good team, but he did look good in that game. And Buffalo's defense is sort of an underrated defense, in my opinion. Agreed. The one, the one that I'm looking at, and you're gonna hate me, but I picked the 49ers. Oh, that hurts, Joe. I thought we were friends. <laughs> I I do have to say, two straight wins on the East Coast to start the season is very impressive. The thing that I'm, the thing that I look back on is. Okay, well, going into the season, I had Cincinnati as the prime 0-16 candidate next to Miami, and then Tampa Bay has Jameis Winston. So I sat there, and I'm like, okay, the defenses they played weren't great. The offenses they played were even worse. So I'll give Jimmy Garoppolo and everything that Kyle Shanahan's done on the offense a lot of credit so far. I just don't trust the defense, especially the secondary. I think DeForest Buckner is a force to be reckoned with up front. I think they have a decent pass rush and okay linebackers with Quan Alexander. I'm not a fan of D Ford, but I, I like Quan Alexander, even though he does miss a lot of tackles. I'm just not a fan of that secondary. And I know it's eventually going to bite them down the road. That's the only reason I have them as a, as the fakest two and O team. They have Pittsburgh this week, and I think they should handle them easy since Mason Rudolph is now starting for them. But the the biggest issue I come back to is the secondary. And then if you look at it on offense, you could really just point out the deficiencies at wide receiver because they don't they don't they don't have a name really. They have Marquise Goodwin, who's a speedster. I'm a fan of Dante Pettis. Don't know where he's been. Obviously, George Kittle at tight end is fantastic, but. To me, you just, you don't have that one guy where if you're in a tight game, he can he can break it open. I think Goodwin can do that, but it's on a he's not very consistent with it, and he can only do it because of his speed. I don't think you have that game breaker in the receiving game because at that point you could just double cover George Kittle, and everyone else is fine on one on one coverage. I could be completely wrong with that. I could be underselling every single 49ers receiver. But just looking at all the 2-0 and teams, I, I think it's them. I think you had a very well-researched and educated response, so I will give you that. It still stings deep down to hear that because, you know, Seattle, as I said, they played that same Cincinnati team at 
home in their home opener and won by one point, and it didn't look like they were going to be able to pull that out until they actually did with uh, you know little to no time left in the game. And that same team, San Francisco, went on the road for the second consecutive week and, and blanked them out. I, I mean, well, blew them out, not blanked them out, but 41-17 is, is a statement for your offense, which was a little quiet week one against Tampa Bay, uh, who I guess has a defense according to their Twitter account. But uh, Tampa Bay would then go on uh, on a short week to beat Carolina at home. So, I mean, I'm all about strength of schedule, strength of opponent, but you are right when it comes to that offense. Uh, I'm a huge Kendrick Bourne fan because he came from Eastern, and I think he's done very well when called upon. They obviously have Debo, who's going to be uh, hopefully a great rookie, but you're – Absolutely right. There is not that one standout receiver uh, or really offensive weapon. Brita, I'm glad he's back and he's doing well. But it seems like they've put a lot into kind of the running back tandem game, and yet they keep getting hit with the injury bug. I mean, we were supposed to have McKinnon for the last two seasons and haven't. So Garoppolo is getting a lot of help from his receiving core, which is great to have that kind of variety. But when the game is on the line, who is he going to throw to if it's not George Kittle? So that will be a question that hopefully uh, gets answered sooner rather than later in a game that's not just supposed to be a automatic win, like playing a Pittsburgh team uh, at home against their uh, backup quarterback, which I'm not going to say is an automatic win. Stranger things have happened. But, you know, it, I was hoping for a bit more of a tougher test for this 49ers team, especially at home. And it looks like I'm going to have to wait uh, a few weeks for that. Yeah, I mean, uh, looking at their schedule, sitting in week four, I think they actually have a bye week super early. So if they can go in 3-0, and I mean, that would be a fantastic start, obviously, to their season, and then come back in week five. They're home against Cleveland on Monday night. Like, they, they currently have a pretty easy schedule until week six when they go to Los Angeles to play the Rams. So they, they could get a good jump start, especially on the division, not just in general in the NFL. But you look at you look at the teams right now. There's three two and O teams in that NFC West division. Yep. And if if I'm just looking at it, it's they're they're arguably in one of the toughest divisions for that reason. Is you have two teams that have been to the playoffs before, and granted Garoppolo's been to the playoffs on a bench, but he's been there, so he kind of understands the field. But a lot of those players on that team don't. So I think when just looking at the overall season as a whole who's going to win that division i don't see san francisco doing it just because one it's the rams and i'm not high on the rams at all i think jared goff's garbage but wow. i think they can i think I, I, goff is terrible i think they can still win the division uh and lose in the second round of the playoffs seattle i will never count out russell wilson i'm a big russell wilson fan and obviously i'm a garoppolo fan as well i just know he's a ticking time bomb when it comes to turnovers especially interceptions. He always makes one or two bad decisions a game. It just matters if the defense capitalizes. That's the reason I kind of put the Rams and the Seahawks ahead of uh, the 49ers and the fact that their defenses, if you stack them up, San Francisco probably falls third because the Rams have Aaron Donald and the Seahawks have Bobby Wagner. The best defensive player and Aaron Donald, and the best linebacker and second-best defensive player in Bobby Wagner. You literally have the two best defensive players in the league in that division on separate teams. So that's what San Francisco is going up against. They're, it's not like they're a terrible team, but it's they're just in a terrible situation. Yeah, and it is the only division with two uh, or with three two and O teams right now. So uh, we've seen in the past where there's been divisions where one team uh, it keeps on winning while the other teams keep on losing. So it's not like you have to exert a whole lot of effort on your part there, but it certainly helps if you keep getting them in the win column. And then we've seen the complete opposite, where you have three teams that are basically chasing wins just to keep pace with the others, so that because you don't know when the the next one is going to lose, and you don't want to have to count on those other teams losing in order for you to hop into that you know second or even first place spot in your division so it is a tough one I'm very excited to see how this plays out a lot of questions that hopefully get answered soon uh, because every week is precious but week two always brings us some of the best overreactions and so I'll close out with this Joe Zolo your favorite ever week two overreaction um every year 
since 2013. Someone has tried to predict the downfall of the New England Patriots <laughs> every single year. Every year they lose week one or they lose week two, it's, oh, it's the end of the dynasty. Oh, it's the end of the Patriots. Everyone, it's week two. Yep. Let's calm down. Let's take a step back. I'm in Dallas right now, and I hear Cowboys fans and Cowboys radio saying, the Cowboys have the best defense in the NFL. Dak Prescott's worth $40 million, which he is not. And they are going to the Super Bowl, and they're going to beat the Patriots in the Super Bowl or the Chiefs in the Super Bowl. And I'm sitting there. I'm like, all right, pump your brakes. You have Jason Garrett as your head coach. <laughs> all right? The biggest thing in the playoffs is coaching, and Jason Garrett has zero coaching ability. He's literally there as the beach boy for uh, Jerry Jones. I can't swear, so I say beach boy for Jerry <laughs> Jones. He's basically his, okay, do this, Jason, do that, Jason. There's a reason Jason Garrett is because he doesn't say anything. This is the same coach that's going to take them to win a Super Bowl that had three straight 8-8 eight and eight seasons. Yeah. No, I'm sorry, that's not happening, Dallas. So that's one currently this year, but one that revolved since 2013 was the demise of the New England Patriots. Yeah, wasn't last year like the, the, the best one because they lost week two to Miami? I don't know if it was last year, but they did lose to Miami either last year or two years ago. I, I always count them out every year in Miami. I think that's an automatic loss. This year, completely different. Miami looks like a pile of garbage. <laughs> so I, I I had bet New England to cover the spread at 19 and a half. So I'll, I'll take that money. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But, yeah, every year, I know the the biggest one was, I think it was Trent Dilfer on Monday Night Football in 2014, week four, after they got blown out by the Chiefs. They, they Everyone was like, this is the end of the dynasty, et cetera, et cetera. That was the we're on to Cincinnati game. Then Belichick, they come home, they blow out Cincinnati, and they go on to win Super Bowl 49 against the Seahawks. And the next five years are history, essentially. So, I don't know. Like I, I sit here and I, I don't want to be cocky and say they're going to make the Super Bowl, but I sit here and say, who is going to stop them yep. in the AFC? Yep. It's the the one team that I think can actually stop them is Kansas City, just because of their offense. Their defense is terrible. So I, I'm like, <laughs> if I were to put, if I were to put both, like the three phases or four phases of the game, including coaching, up against each other, the offense I give to Kansas City just because of Patrick Mahomes. He's younger. He throws the ball further, and they're more electric. Yep. Defense, without a doubt, I give to New England. The coaching, I don't think anyone would argue that Bill Belichick's a better coach than Andy Reid. And then you look at um, special teams. I also, I, I mean, the kicking game I give to um, Kansas City because Harrison Bucker is one of my favorite young kickers. But the punting game, our young punters look pretty good. So I would give it to New England. So it's basically a wash. Yeah. So you're sitting there as they're one and one on defense. I always give the coaching edge in in the playoffs, and every year Belichick has owned Andy Reid in the playoffs. So it, <laughs> and that, that thing is, who's going to stop them? I don't know. Ben Roethlisberger's on IR, so that's not happening. Um, do we trust second year quarterback Lamar Jackson to outshoot them? It's like th- those are really the only teams and. I'm like I was on the Cleveland bandwagon to be like, all right, I think Cleveland wins a division, and now I realize Freddie Kitchens is a terrible head coach, <laughs> and he should just be an offensive coordinator. <laughs> he can't coach his O line. He can't keep his guys uh, straight. It's he can't coach defense. There's so much wrong in Cleveland right now, but he just has so many shiny objects. And Baker Mayfield, Landry, Beckham, Nick Chubb. He doesn't know how to use them. The fact that Nick Chubb is not on the field three every every down blows my mind. He's not a good head coach. Cleveland, again, will not make the playoffs. It, it's unbelievable. I thought they were a shoe-in to win the division, and now they're not going to make the playoffs. What a, what a terrible life Cleveland fans live. <laughs> yeah, but good thing is is that you're a New England Patriots fan, which might come with a lot of hate, but at least you have a lot of wins and trophies to back it up. So there's always a silver lining to every gray cloud out there. But, Joe, this has been a lot of fun. I really appreciate your time coming on here and talking uh, NFL in Week 2 over reactions. It took some doing, but we finally got you on, so you can be added to the great list of uh, special guests I've had. But, hey, man. Thank you so much again. It was great meeting you at Hall of Fame week, and uh, you take care of yourself, all right? I appreciate it, man. Thank you very much for having me on. Absolutely. Take care now. Have a good one.
Have a good one. And one more big thank you to Joe Zolo, the head of a marketing director for Forefront. Don't know why I couldn't say that before, but I can now. <laughs> Out of mind blank. And also, as we finish up this uh, Tuesday edition of the Fan Show, went a little longer than expected, but I'm happy we did so because it was a lot of fun. Uh, it took us two tries, and we got it on the second one. But the end of an era in Iowa as head coach Dixie Wooten and the Barnstormers have agreed to part ways. I saw this coming for a while. And we'll talk more about it on the Thursday episode since I did not really touch on it in this one. But there were several signs. There was some writing on the wall. And uh, we wish him the best on his future endeavors, as they say. So that will do it for our Tuesday edition, episode 430, actually, not 450. I don't know how I got 20 ahead of myself, but episode 430 was a great one. We had a great special guest. We'll have another great special guest Thursday. Tomorrow, of course, is our weekly BattleBot special, assuming I can run down a guest as they get more and more uh, frantic uh, because of the push to the tournament championship uh but i do have plenty of video content that i'm sure will more than suffice in the meantime so uh make sure that you're liking the facebook page facebook.com slash fan show official so you can always see those subscribe to the youtube channel uh give us a follow on twitter at fan show official or the robotics division of course is uh at fan show underscore robotic and then the instagram is the fan show you can subscribe and listen and love and enjoy on your terms and your time iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. We, of course, broadcast live, and you can also subscribe to Spreaker.com. So until next time, ladies and gentlemen, it's not fan show official unless it's... (laughs) I knew I couldn't do it. It's been one of those days, folks. So let's try this again. Remember, folks, it's not official unless it's fan show official, and we're officially out of here. So until next time, best of luck to you and yours. Go Niners, and it's all fun and games until you butt fumble. Good night, folks. Do you remember the time that Mark Sanchez ran into his players' butt? That was funny sports. Thank you for having me on the show, man. I love the fan show.